Hey guys, this is Johnny. And this is Brent. And we got some huge news that we want to share with you guys. That's right. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. Yes! And we're <laughs> so excited to be a part of this network along with some other amazing podcasts, you guys. That's right. So make sure and check out americansongwriter.com slash podcast or click the link in the episode notes to listen to some of the best shows in music. Johnny, do your thing. Welcome to the clan! This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. As a matter of fact, that's what the climb means. C-L-I-M-B, creating leverage in the music business. Why? Because that's what you're going to need to get ahead, and that's what we're here. We're here to help you win, to get some business behind you, get some results happening, because that's how you're going to take it to the next level. Nobody's going to reach down and pull you up. You're going to have to climb up first. That's why we called it The Climb, and that's a Baxter name from my good friend and co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter. Brent's an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Antebellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And he also helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you can write like a pro, do business like a pro, and on the regular, he connects you to the pro so you can have a shot to create a relationship. You can find Brent super easy at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. If you're an artist and you're looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV, and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists such as Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That is production. Singular, no S, and there is no S because there is no other Johnny D. What's up, Mr. Number One? We've got a number uh, one on the radio right now. Oh, thank you. We're going to have to stop saying that soon. They only last for a month at a time, sadly. But, but we got to ride every single part of that wave, brother. We are. <laughs> we are going to. I'll be like, oh, the chart came out today and we dropped <laughs> one of these days. But we're going to ride it till then. But we also have other good news, which we, if you listen to the very intro of the podcast you heard, but just to reiterate in case you skip some of the intro, naughty boys and girls. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. Yes, this is fantastic. Um, we've gotten uh, created a relationship here with Dan and Zach and the people over at American Songwriter Magazine. This is a killer brand. This has been around, I think, since the early 80s. You can't smack the smile off my face when I think about all the people that have been on the cover of American Songwriter Magazine. <laughs> and now they've created a podcast network with three verticals. So vertical number one is songwriting. Vertical number two is the music business. And vertical number three is anything, I think, production and engineering kind of stuff. And over here at The Climb, we're nailing two out of three of those verticals. So That's right. It's a major navigational point on the website at americansongwriter.com. And listen, there's going to be a lot of press about this kind of coming out, a lot of stuff we're going to be sharing with you. And we're going to be interviewing some hosts from the other podcasts under this big network umbrella. And likewise, we will be interviewed by some of those hosts and their podcasts over those. So hopefully we can turn you on to some more value here for different things that, uh, that might interest you guys. And I'm just, I'm psyched. Yeah, man, I'm pumped. I'm looking at the uh, americansongwriter.com slash podcast right now, and, and they're starting to put some of the podcasts up. So uh, hopefully by the time y'all listen to this, the, the climb will be active and live on there as well. We've got our logo on there, but hopefully they'll start uh, spinning our stuff over there pretty soon, just getting the tech stuff worked out. But some of the other shows I see, I'm a faithful listener of the Pitch List podcast with Chris Lindsay. He's actually been a guest on the climb uh, several episodes mm. ago, maybe about yeah. a year and a half ago now. But uh, he's a hit songwriter and I listen to his stuff and I've done stuff with him for Songwriting Pro. So I've just been listening to that. So I'm stoked to be in there with him and I'm going to be learning the other podcasts and listening to those as well. But uh, what I know of the podcast on there are great. So I feel like I'm in good company. Right on. Let's get going here. Well, first of all, what are we going to learn today from you? We are going to talk about 
publisher meetings and how to prepare for one. So let's say, hey, congratulations, you finally tracked down a music publisher. You've gotten that meeting you've been hoping for, but now what? How do you make it a success? How do you avoid blowing this opportunity? So we're going to talk about how to prepare. Cocktails. Cocktails, right. Sometimes that helps. Uh, so we're going to talk about <laughs> what to do you know, before your meeting to help set you up for success in that meeting. That's what we're talking about Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's take care of a little business first. We still got nothing but love for our friends over at Disc Makers here. It's a digital world, still an important role for physical media and today's independent musician. And this is the kind of stuff that's, you know, it's going to get you from one place to the other. Digital royalty payments are so small that the way you're going to get from one place to the other, like point A on your tour to point B on your tour is by selling CD, vinyl, and T-shirts at the gigs. That's right. For every CD you sell at a gig, you need about 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money. That's a lot of streams. That's a whole lot of streams these days, right? And we love streams. Go get you some. But we believe that you're leaving money on the table when you don't have merch on the table. But thankfully, our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your disc and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even t-shirts. And you can find them online at discmakers.com. That is D-I-S-C makers.com. Or give them a call at 800-468-9353. That's 800-468-9353. That's right. Join the Climb community if you haven't done so. We have a thriving community here. Uh, musicians, songwriters, people getting connected, getting co-writes, people asking questions, marketing questions, artist development questions, social media questions, and everybody's helping everybody else. We got uh, several different places to spotlight your stuff. So when you go there, don't just you know spray and pray. This is not a place to promote your music, but it is a place to celebrate your wins. You just got to do it in the right place, okay? Uh, okay. Um, and you'll figure that out when you get there. But listen, we let everybody in, but you got to ask to be let in. That's right. We don't spam, we jam. That's right. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to consume podcasts. We're everywhere. Make sure you leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200 here. We're trying to get to 200. I feel like we're stuck at 152. Let's go. Go, go put something on there. And hopefully it's a five star, but hey, we read them all on the air. We take them on the chin if that's the way you feel. And uh, finally, tell a friend about it. That's really the best thing that you can do, man. If you found something that really made you think, that gave you pause, that maybe we reframed something for you, you found some kind of value from this, then by all means, please share it on social media and tell somebody about it. Let them know how much it's helping you because then we can help them. That's what we're here for. That's right. Well, let's get into this. Let's man. get into it. What do I got to do for a publisher meeting? So you're saying hookers and heroin, a couple cocktails. These are bad ideas before you roll in. You and know, you're like, give me a deal. <laughs> <laughs> give me a deal. Right. I'm not going to tell you what's a bad idea. Let's just focus on what's a good idea. Okay. All <laughs> there right. We go. I'm going to tell you what's right for your genre. Yeah, this is for you had that meeting coming up, right? The meeting's coming up in a couple of days. You finally got locked down where they're like, hey, come on by for a few minutes. Let's visit. You're like, sweet. Okay. We want to help you make that a success. So, I got uh, what I got here, like five things here. I like numbers and stuff. So let's do five things. First thing you want to do is you want to define your goals for this meeting and beyond. Why are you going to sit down with this publisher? Do you ever walk in and go, yeah, you said to come by, let's hang out. So just hang on. What's up? You know, that's not the most efficient way to do it because that can just kind of lead to some awkwardness. You want to have some goals. You want to think about this ahead of time. What do I want out of this? What do I want to give? What do I want to hopefully work toward with this? So are you there for feedback so you can learn and get better? Are you there for just relationship building? Are you there talking to a publisher because you want to write hits for other artists or for yourself as an artist? Do you want a publishing deal? Do you want co-writes? All that stuff, right? Or both. Are you writing for yourself or the radio? Stuff like that is going to come up in your conversation. You want to be thinking about it as you're talking to this person so it feels like you know what you're doing. How can the publisher help you get where you want to go if you don't even know where you want to go? You know, publisher meetings can oftentimes be kind of similar to PRO meetings. I remember hearing about this PRO meeting where this writer had been meeting with this PRO, like an ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC rep for, you know, a few meetings over months or years or whatever. And they'd go sit, they'd listen to some songs, they'd talk some, and all right, well, holler back later sometime. And that was kind of it, right? The rep didn't really do anything for the writer. And then finally, one time the writer said, you know, man, I just really want to get cuts by other artists. I really want to. And the rep was like, oh, let me pick up the phone for you. Let me call some publishers that can help you out. He's like, 
why didn't you do this like long ago? Because I didn't know what you wanted. Because <laughs> you didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you just play me songs, that sort of thing. So it's like, how could they help you if, the, if you haven't clearly defined what your goals are? I'm sure people walk in there with all kinds of stuff, right? I got something I got to say here. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one thing your goal can't be is to find out what they're going to do for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you consider yourself to be a competitive songwriter, and you're interested in creating relationships in the music business, in the publishing part of the music business in that sector, then you should have 100% of your energy and your attention and your thoughts should be focused on what you can do for them mm-hmm. and just create that relationship. And you, you mentioned something, like you said before, it's like, is this just relationship building? Is that one of the reasons? Relationship building, it struck me when you said that, Brent, is like a really kind of boring worn out sort of vague <laughs> yeah. thing, right? What's relationship building? We've developed a very, very close relationship with Murph Music and Song Placement Pros now mm-hmm. and with Ray Hamilton and Blue Foley over there. And when I first met them, I just trying to get to know him. Yeah. Just trying to figure out like what he's up to, what he's about. He's trying to figure out the same thing about me. And what I'm looking for is how can I add value to this guy? Mm-hmm. Right. And then through some different conversations we had, I started realizing that, hey, I think I could help you here. And I started to offer that kind of help. Now, maybe I mean, a publisher needs hit songs, needs really good songs. Right. So as long as you have that mentality and that swagger of I know that I am a competitive songwriter, then you are going to be able to add value as maybe somebody on the peripheral initially that can work their way in to the inner circle, but it's not going to come from you going in there expecting a single song contract or a publishing deal or for them to bow down at your feet mm-hmm. or, or anything like that. It's like if you go in there and you just honestly from your heart think like, what can I do to help you out? Then you'd be amazed. A quick side note, like mm-hmm. I, the first time I met Rick Barker, or maybe it was the second time, that's Taylor Swift's old manager, friend of mine. He had just moved into this new office and was setting stuff up, and he does a lot of stuff virtually with different uh, management conference stuff like all over the world. And this new office was just really reflective, and I just I was in there just trying to get to know Rick, trying to find out what he's about, and thinking about, is there any way that I can add value to this team, to his cause? Like, what can I do mm-hmm. to help? And it was just a weird, random thing, but I'm like, dude, it's super reflective in here. And he's like, yeah, I know. And, you know, he's got that radio voice. Like, that Rick yeah, had. no. <laughs> yeah. And it just booms. And I'm like, well, I've got some extra studio treatment stuff at my house. Just sit in the garage. You want it? And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He goes, let's go right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it was just a silly thing. Yeah. Uh, but right then, there, in that little moment, it meant the world to him, I think. You know, I don't want to speak for him, but I mean, it was like, wow, you just eliminated like one problem that I'm going to have to take care of. Well, I mean, it meant enough <laughs> to him. He was like, let's go right now. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, there you you go, know, that's, that's a proof right there. And you may say it's a little thing, but man, how rare is that? I mean, those people really stand out in your life that are just, how can I help you? What can I do for you? You know? Yeah. Having that conversation where it's like, so tell me what's going on. I was like, man, I'm not exactly sure right now. I mean, we just met and I'm just trying to figure out, search for different ways that I can add value to what you're doing. When you say that, all of a sudden, the immediate defense is down. Can I go off on another tangent? I'm not trying to step on your oh, show. Oh, man, here, go, but go right ahead. With all this stuff going on in the news today, I was thinking about how the most dangerous part of a police officer's job is when they, on a traffic stop, when they walk from their car to the car they just pulled over because they don't know what they're walking into. Right. Right. Yeah. So whenever I get pulled over, and it's happened a few times, <laughs> right? Say, it's enough you have a strategy now. Go ahead. <laughs> I got a strategy for everything. <laughs> so whenever I get pulled over, I'm aware of this and I know that there's probably a really, really good chance that this police officer maybe is in a bad mood. Maybe he's just a jerk trying to get over on people. Maybe he's the nicest guy in the world and he's scared out of his life for a second. You know, he's not sure what's going to happen. Right. So I psychologically play that game and try to eliminate that stress. If I pull over, all the windows are down. If it's at night, the dome light is on. My hands, both hands, out the driver's side window, palms open and facing backward towards the cop. Mm -hmm. So he knows right away 
It just diffuses any kind of possible tension whatsoever. And half the time, this is a little side trick, a little value bomb for you guys. Half the time they ask me, are you on the job? Uh, And I'm like, just do what you got to do, officer. No, no, I'm asking, are you on the job, officer? Just do what you got to do. And sometimes I get a ticket and sometimes I don't. (laughs) But Uh it's showing them that I care about their situation right now. Right? Yeah. And what they're going through. And so when you go into a publisher meeting and you're like, I'm just wondering if there's, you know, what I can do to add value to this whole thing. All of a sudden, the underlying tension of what is this guy? Who's this guy? Who's this girl? Are they all about themselves? You know, and you lead with something like that. That's got to be powerful. And just take everything settles down. And now we can just get to know one another. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. And so going back, you know, what are your goals for this meeting? Is it just transactional? I'm going to walk in here with a hit and then have them throw some papers. I'll sign them. Then I'll go and I'll start shopping for a boat. That's unrealistic, by the way. Bad idea. Or is it I want to <laughs> I want to help them somehow. I want to add value to them. I want to see what's on their radar. You know, I want to learn. I want to get feedback on a song. What are you wanting for this? You'll have a lot better chance getting what you want if you have an idea of what you want. Right. And what you can give. Number two thing is to write down a list of questions and or topics you want to cover. Don't just take a mental note. Write it down. By the way, write it down. Have it in front of you. And when you get there, write it down. Did I mention you should write it down? Here's the thing. (laughs) When you get into it and you get nervous or you get happy or get frustrated or whatever, you're likely to forget something that you want to talk about. Because for one thing, you may not want the dead air of going, what was that one thing that I wanted to talk about? And you're thinking about that while either that person's saying something that you should be taking in, the publisher's talking, and you're just thinking about, what was that other thing I wanted to talk about? So therefore, that's not a good use of time. You're not present. You might as well not be there, right? Or after they say something, you just don't want that pregnant pause while you're going, okay, he's looking at me. What was that thing I wanted to t- I'll, I'll just say something else, you know? If there's certain things you do want to ask about, whether it's, I'm an out-of-town writer. What are your feelings on that? Or what are some ways I can attack this thing from out of town? Or whatever the thing might be you want to talk about. It's just a lot easier if you just have a little note. And, you know, you just want to prioritize that list to make sure it's as easy as possible to get to the important ones. You know, put the the top ones at the top, right? Yeah. And did I mention you should write this down? (laughs) And also... Take notes during the meeting. I have a little red spiral notebook that I use for all my meetings. I take it in my meetings just because inevitably they're going to mention a name that I want to follow up on, do some homework on, or they're going to say, oh, you should call so-and-so. or so. Instead of putting it in my phone, I just like, have this notebook. And then I also have the songs listed that I may play for them, that sort of stuff. And it also serves as a journal. I keep those, and it's fun. I've gone back and looked at some of my earliest meetings with – ASCAP or with Major Bob music or, you know, these different things and go, wow, you know, can't believe it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's fun to look back on later and see progress and also to kind of cringe at the songs that you actually played for professionals. (laughs) 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 I was was going, wow, I'd led with that one. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. That was 2003, wasn't it? That means you grew. Yes, which is good, which is good. But yeah, it's also just kind of a little bit of a business journal of, of looking back over it. But you know, when you have that notebook and it doesn't look odd or anything, you walk in there, it's like, hey, man, I just want to take notes, you know? It's show that you're present and you're engaged and you care about this and you take it seriously. And people may actually be more apt to go, you know, you should just call so-and-so or here's a number or whatever it might be if they know that you're actually prepared to, like, write it down and you're hungry for that. Love it. Yeah, so gather up your questions and stuff you want to talk about. There are a couple things beforehand. Write it down. Ready for number three? Yes, sir. Number three is to choose your songs. And this is assuming that you're going to play some songs for the publisher. And sometimes they haven't specifically said that. I always just want to be prepared to play a couple songs for somebody just because, hey, that's the coin of the realm, right? Yep. So even if you haven't talked about it, I just like to have it in my hip pocket just in case. So you want to decide on your songs based on the ones which are most relevant to your goals. You know, if your goal is to be a hit country songwriter, but you bring your novelty gospel song to show your range, it's kind of a waste of time. That's not what that publisher does. You want to bring what's fitting for that publisher, something that might solve their problems and also move you in the direction of your goals. So you want to bring songs that are aiming in that direction. And you also want to order your songs in order of importance Mm. because you might not get to them all. You may only get to play one. You might not get to play any. You might get to play three of them. I don't know. But... You don't want to save your, man, this is my deal closer till the end because you may not get it. And then you're going to feel like you kind of want to push you know, for one more song, and that could be off-putting, 
right? They're ready to go. They have a they have another meeting or they have a lunch, and they go. We got time for one more, and then you're automatically kind of losing before the song even spins. So hey, I, I mm-hmm. got a question. So when you say that, you got to think about like the opposite of a movie, where the big climax is at the end. Right. You got to leave with the climax. Like oh, you got to sure. come right in with the boom, and then they're gonna view the rest of the songs with a different set of lenses. After they've heard the strongest thing that you can do, right? Yes, for sure, yeah. Don't wait for the big close. That's a guy I never thought of it like that. Some people would be like, yeah, I'm going to plan it all out, and we're going to fall in love, and then boom. Boom. You know, I'm going to drop the bomb, and then all of a sudden, phone rings. Oh, my kid's sick. I got to run out. Yeah, Sorry. Like, I just, uh, but yeah. that was my... Uh, oh. yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> stuff is going to happen. Stuff gets cut short. You may start late, and therefore you don't have as much time. All that stuff. It's like, man, lead with your best. Lead with your best. You know, this changes over time with technology, but my general you know, advice is to always burn a CD, even if you plan on playing live. Because what if you break a string or a finger in the middle of your first song, right? So I don't know how you break a finger in the middle of your first song, but what happens? <laughs> you know, you're about to walk in, and you close your finger in the car door. I don't know. But even if you're going to, like, I want to play live because that's my jam. Bring a recording of it. Because what if they, like, oh, I want to listen to that again. You got to, rec- no, I don't. I just played it live. Can I play it again and hit record on your phone? No. What if they want to play it for an artist later that day? You know, just be prepared. It's better to have that and not need it than to need it and not have it. Um, and also, if you do bring in, like, a CD, label it clear, professionally, with all your contact info. If it gets in a stack of, you know... Not a big sloppy doctor writing with a sharpie. Yeah, is this, what is that? I don't know what that says. That's not helpful. And a lot of times you won't leave it, you know, because these days some publishers don't even have CD players anymore. I did an event with the publisher and I brought like a CD of songs. They're like, uh, I don't have a CD player. Okay. You're like, huh. Right. Let me plug my phone <laughs> in. And so that may be a thing. Like, okay, maybe I need to plug my phone into an aux thing so they can play it through the speakers. Usually what I'll do is if I have time to prep for the meeting, is I'll go ahead and do a song space link, put together my little playlist, best song at the top, and I'll email it to them maybe right beforehand. That way, if they'd rather play it off there, they don't have a CD player or whatever, they can just play it right off there. And if they dig it, boom, they already got a copy of it in their email, suitable for forwarding, you know? And so I'll try to do that or I'll follow up with it going, hey, here's those songs from today. May give you a reason to kind of have a little touch point follow up like hey you mentioned you liked a couple of these songs I just wanted to send you a link where you can download listen pass it along whatever could they do like SoundCloud or something too like an industry page for SoundCloud where maybe it's not out there publicly but it's easily accessible uh, you know I don't personally do that but I believe yeah you can have private links on SoundCloud uh, I use SongSpace and there are bound to be others as well so kind of whatever works for you I try not to do Dropbox but that's probably pretty common as well just because it makes them downloaded and stuff and it's like here's just a link you can play right from it uh, but that might yeah. be a thing too or maybe have options hey which would you prefer I just want to make it as easy form as possible to listen to your song because then if you're like spending five minutes trying to get the tech worked out, it's not a good use of your time or theirs. That's a party killer. That's a party foul right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. What's also cool though, if you do have the aux cable, which don't be even shy to bring one, like in your guitar case or something, you know, from your phone so you can plug into their things. That way, if you have something like a song space and you want to call an audible in the middle of it, you can just bring up your app right there and go, oh, let's play this one instead, which is cool too. But that's the thing. You just want to think about that beforehand. So you're not sitting there going, uh, yeah, let me think of what to play for you. They're like, you don't even know what you want to play, you know? <laughs> Choose your songs ahead of time. It sounds pretty basic, but hey, we just want to make sure we cover the basis. Number four is type your lyrics. I always like to make two copies of the type lyrics. One for the writer, right? One for myself in case you get nervous and you forget them in the middle of your own song in case you're playing. And one for the publisher. Some publishers don't look at lyrics. Others do. But again, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Uh, plus, it might be something they can write notes on, or you can write notes on your own lyric if they're giving you feedback on the song. You can just circle certain words that they talked about, and you can play along at home, right? You can make your own notes. I don't care how much you like your own handwriting. A typed lyric is just more professional. makes a better impression. Mm-hmm. And also, put your contact info on every page of the lyric. It doesn't matter how awesome your song is if the publisher can't find you later and they can't remember who wrote it. So contact info on everything you can. That's one of the beautiful things about 
the song space that I use, and I don't have any affiliation with them other than I pay them to use it. But you send a link, and they have the the writers right there. They have the lyrics right there if you put it in, and then they can download or just stream the song. It's all right there. Therefore, I don't have to bring in type lyrics. It's like it's on the link. It's right there. And so it's less paper they have to keep up with, but it also has my contact information right there. So there you, go. you just want to look professional and have it in case they prefer. And you can just ask them, hey, I brought lyrics. Would you like to look at it? And a lot of people are like, no, nah, I just want to listen because they just want to take the, kind of the whole thing in as a listener would without getting too much thinking. But other times they may want it, or they may want to reference something in the second verse. Like, oh, here's a lyric. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, this third line of the second verse here, there's something here that help them help you. Right. Maybe it's something they love, maybe it's something they didn't love, but help them help you just by making it easy for them to see whatever they want to see. Rolling right along. Yes. Number five, research your publisher. Know who you're talking to. Now, I'm not talking about hiding in the bushes outside their office and getting dirt on them. It's not like opposition research or anything. But who's going to be sitting across the desk from you? Have they published a hit? Who are their current staff writers? You know, knowing some of their cuts and some of their writers does a couple things. One, it makes you look more professional and prepared. Always a good thing, right? Yeah. Two, it can spur relevant, helpful conversation. Like, hey, how did you get happy and love to George Urban? What was the process of that? Do you pitch that to him yourself or you send it to the A&R people or whatever? You know, because you know that they published Happy and Love for an artist named George Urban. And so, therefore, you can ask about it. Right. Yeah, and then number one shows that you know about him uh-huh. or her, the publisher. That just feels good. And then number two, you're also asking an open-ended question. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to get them talking. And the more they talk, the better off you're going to be. <laughs> right. Exactly. And you know, it allows you to get some kind of inside information on just how the business works. Yeah, man, I'm friends with a producer. We we're having drinks down at Losers, and blah blah blah. And he mentioned this, and I sent him that. And you're like, oh, the hang is important. Getting that intel that's not didn't come off a pitch sheet. Oh, you know, and you have the chance to pick up on this other knowledge that's not hidden, not secret. You know, you're not doing anything devious. You're not getting them to slip up and tell the truth. But you just ask them, like you said, Johnny, an open ended question that's relevant to them and allows them maybe to toot their own horn a little bit or just have a feeling like, yeah, that that did work. Yeah, you know who you're talking to. Oh, and also, it helps you avoid some that I don't want you to have to ever feel, which is when you like badmouth an artist or a song or something, which is never a good idea. Then on the way out, you see that artist album hanging on that publisher's wall. <laughs> and you're like, I'm just going to I'm just going to remove never myself back. from the building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to just walk out of the store and then walk right into the street, wait for something to come knock me over. So <laughs> for one thing, just put on your happy hat when you walk in there. But, you know, before you walk in, put on your everything's an opportunity. There are no challenges and the world is good. <laughs> you know, positivity. You, yeah. wanna, you don't want to come in there prepared to bellyache about something or complain or complain about songs that are successful while yours aren't, that kind of stuff. There's no point in bad mouthing anyone's work because they've done something that you probably haven't done. Don't hate, investigate. That's my motto. <laughs> don't hate, investigate. Unless... You're with people that you really, really know. Yeah. And you got to vent a little or something. Yeah, that's different. That's never a good idea because you never know where the hell you're going to be. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't have anything to do with anybody saying negative. But remember we went to that Songwriter Awards with Chelsea? Oh, and- yeah, yeah. The yeah Nashville Songwriter Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Yeah. Yeah, it was you, me, and Chelsea. And, and now Chelsea never says a bad word about anybody, okay? She's perfect, but... I remember she's talking, and she didn't even realize it at one point, but standing right behind her is Garth Brooks. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like crazy. And so if she was that person, which she's not, she is the sweetest person on the planet. That's why we felt safe taking her. (laughs) That's right. And she ends up getting a picture with him and stuff, which is awesome. But I mean, if if she was doing something stupid like that, man... That's embarrassing. And you know what? Like in Nashville, you just never know oh, no. who you're going to be sitting next to, who's going to be overhearing what you're saying on a plane, whatever. It's just in any industry, but in this entertainment industry, man, you just, gosh, don't do it. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, I had an experience one time. This is years ago. So I was fresh off the turnip truck and we were at the Sunset Grill and it was after some industry kind of thing. And anyway, I'm talking to a guy. It's kind of dark in there. And I can't really see, but you're just talking to people, whatever. A bunch of industry people there, and I'm just green as a gourd. And 
Monday Morning Church had been cut, but it hadn't been released yet. That's this time period, right? So I'm just starting out. Gotcha. And so I'm talking to this guy. He's like, I don't know if you asked me if I had anything going on. You're a writer. You had anything, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, man, I just got an Alan Jackson cut. It hadn't come out yet. He goes, oh, really? What is it? I said, a song called Monday Morning Church. He goes, man, I love that song. I go, really? How you know You're it? You're talking to Keith Stagall? Yeah, I said, how you know it? He goes, I produced it. It was Keith Stagall. <laughs> You're like, holy oh, crap, I was I'm like, wait. say something stupid. <laughs> it was dark in there. The light was coming from on top of him, like these little candle. I'm like, what? You don't look like your picture in Music Row Magazine, your headshot from 10 years ago. You know? Yeah. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. I'm just glad I didn't say, well, I got an Alan Jackson cut. It's about time, too. I mean, his stuff lately has been sucking. It's about time he gets to turn that around. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Good thing I didn't try to like be a big shot and be like, yeah, it's, you know, finally we're going to, you know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Based on this latest stuff, this ought to be definitely be number one or whatever, you know, and just be (laughs) trying to be cool, you know. Thank goodness. I was like, oh, sorry. (laughs) You know. So. Oh, that's funny. They don't always look like they're headshots, by the way. He didn't have like a third eye or anything, but just in the dark, I just didn't recognize him. Hadn't seen him in person before. So do some research. Who's writing for him? Because it was kind of a meeting, but it was prepping for a uh, play for publisher and some different stuff. And I was meeting with Scott Sherrod, and I did some research on his people and found out one of them is traveling from out of town. You know, it's like, oh, how does that work with this guy coming in from out of town? Actually, I think I picked that up because while Scott and I were talking, he came in, one of the writers, and was... Like, oh, I'm just in from Virginia. And we talked about that a little bit, so it became something we could talk about. But just keeping your antenna open for, like, where are their writers? Are their writers all in town? What do their writers have done? The more you can know, for one thing, if you know if you just, hey, I'm right on top of so-and-so's lane. Or, oh, I may bring something a little bit different than what they already have covered. Because that's an important thing if you want a publishing deal is usually they don't need more of what they already have. Unless what they have is flying off the shelf so fast, they're like, we'll take as much of it as we can get, which is not usually the case. So you want to kind of find your own lane, which may have an effect on what songs you bring in. Oh, you know what? They got A, B, and D covered. I'm going to bring in lane C. They may not have a lot of those, may not like them. Maybe that's why they don't have a lot of them that you hear being cut, or maybe they just want them and I can provide them. Yeah. Which is helping them. So it's good to do your research. And one more thing about that. This occurs to me, too. You know what the greatest defeater or the greatest antidote is to the imposter syndrome? What? Information. Mm -hmm. Information. When you feel like you can speak intelligently about a certain someone or a certain publishing company and their writers and stuff like that Mm. because you did your research then all of a sudden when you shoot out that first thing and they start to realize that you're learned if Mm. you will about them and then all of a sudden that banter starts to happen and then you just kind of slide out of and i don't think i belong here inside your head right into oh this is going really good this guy kind of likes me or this girl kind of likes me like they're, they're they're just talking with me like i'm another writer like, yeah. okay. I can, I can have. <laughs> yeah. When I first moved to Nashville, uh, a couple months in or so, or a couple weeks in, I, I interviewed at Blue Water Music for just a data entry job, part time data entry, putting in other people's royalty data. And so it would have been my first gig in the music business. And yeah, I did some research on who wrote for Blue Water. And I was a fan of a lot of, of, a lot of their writers who are also like indie artists, like Chris Knight, Kim Ritchie, Jim Lauderdale. And so I was able to go in there and talk about like, oh, yeah, man, I love that Chris got so-and-so cut by John Anderson or Kim Ritchie with all those number ones that were on her record. I'm mean, Yeah. And, you know, they already were impressed that I kind of knew some of their catalog, like their writers, because they weren't big household names. But these people are awesome. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And yeah, I could talk about it. And so I just yeah. felt like I belonged more. And so that, yeah. you know, I'm sure did not hurt my chances of landing that job. And yeah, that was a paid data entry job, which is not the same as a pub deal, but the same principle applies. Like, oh, okay, you already feel like you are familiar with some of our people and you kind of know what's yeah. up. It's just that much easier to feel like you're a part of things. And you don't feel like an idiot because you took some time to either research that or you just were genuinely fans prior to that of those and you were aware of who they were as writers. Mm -hmm. My dad would always say it's the seven P's. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) Pretty sure that's a Marine thing, but 
you know, you take an hour of your life before that big meeting, the big, big meeting that you're nervous about and learn as much as you can about that and think about how far that's going to go towards your nerves, your inner dialogue in the moment of that meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And the more you can learn about the business, the more you hear names and you maybe you see one of those writers out somewhere and you're like, hey, you write for so-and-so publishing, don't you? Man, that's great over there. I just had a meeting with so-and-so or I got a meeting with so-and-so coming up next week or just knowing the players, the people, the lay of the land, it allows serendipity to happen. I think it just gives you more ammunition than, ah, I bumped into a guy, talked to him. No idea who he was. I was in an airport on a trip between Missouri and, and Nashville. I was sitting in Dallas on a layover, and I see this hit rider who's also you know making a trip. He's in Dallas, so he's on the layover as well. And it was Alan Shamblin, who wrote The House That Built Me. He walked on oh, water. Wow. He had, so I'm like, oh, cool, that's Alan Shamblin. And he had a guy with him that, you know, you could kind of hear him talking and stuff. It's like, that guy's a, a rider, too. Dang it, I can't place that face. I didn't know who he was. I'm sure I knew the name and I'd know who he was if someone was like, oh, that's so-and-so. I'm sure I would know. But I just couldn't place a face. And so part of me wanted to walk up to Alan and say, hey, can we get you on the climb or something? You know, and start a conversation. Yeah. But I didn't know who yeah. the other guy was. And so therefore I was like, crap, I'm not going to go up and be like, you're Alan Shamblin and you're probably somebody too. All right, who are you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You're probably awesome, too. <laughs> so I didn't. I didn't go up. A few minutes later, Kix Brooks sits like two seats down from me. And I'm like, oh, I know who you are. I'm talking to you. Oh, my God. So we had that conversation. But I made buddies with Kix Brooks at that Hall of Fame well, thing was, we were just was, talking about. <laughs> yeah, it was like slightly before that. It might have been my trip in for that. So do your research. It's just going to help you. I'm about ready to close this down. But here's how it works. You know, I don't want to just help you prepare for your publisher meeting. Here at Songwriting Pro, we try to connect you to the pros. So I want to help you get a meeting with a publisher. And there's ways that we do this, Johnny. I know you're aware of this. Oh, uh, yeah. Here's what's going on. In July, Songwriting Pro is hosting another Play for a Publisher event. And this time we have two, not one, two publishers. We have Butch Baker of Mojo Music and Media. Butch, man, he, he works with Dean Dillon. I'm trying to remember names right now. See? I'm blanking on names. Bart Butler. <laughs> Bart Butler, who's a hit songwriter. He produces John Party. So there's just a lot of legit folks coming in and out of Butch's office all day. So that's Butch Baker. We also have Courtney Allen of BMG Music. You got like Travis Meadows over at BMG. You just have Hillary Lindsay's over there. BMG's legit. They just got a ton of people over there. So these are both legit publishers that are out there slinging songs, getting cuts, that kind of stuff. And I want to help you get face-to-face -face with them online from anywhere in the world and play your song for them. Here's how it works. You submit your song, I listen, and I pick the 10 that I think have the best chance to catch the publisher's ear. Then these quote-unquote top 10 writers and I meet up with the publisher for an online Zoom video conference where each of the top 10 songs will be played and the publisher and writer can then talk about it. They play your song, the recorded version of it, demo or work tape or whatever. They hear it. They'll give you their thoughts, and you actually have a few minutes for some follow-up conversation. So it's just like the 12 of us in that meeting. We're doing two different meetings, one with Butch, one with Courtney, same 10 songs. So you get two different points of view on your song, which is going to be really valuable, I think. And not only that, but everybody that submits a song gets to watch the replay. So I'll send the replay yeah. out only to the people that bought a submission spot. That's money right there. Yeah, it's such a good deal because that's going to be like three hours worth of listening to these songs that made it, hearing feedback, and hearing some back and forth. And they drop a lot of wisdom in this stuff. They're like, well, here's the problem with this. And they'll start diagnosing other people's songs, either what they love about them, what they think works, what they think is a stumbling block for the song, what they're hearing on the streets, what's working for them lately, what's not working for them, and just general wisdom, right? Yeah. All this stuff, just right from people that are in it and doing it every dang day and so even if your song isn't chosen you still come out a winner if you watch the replays and are willing to adapt and learn and add that to your repertoire you know add that to your knowledge bank so if you want to get the details on the play for a publisher event we do these quarterly so if you miss this one i probably have another one coming up in a month so to get the details just go to songwritingpro.com and look under the events and workshop tab basically that's songwritingpro.com slash events and that tell you what we have coming up, and you can link right there to get the details, who the current publisher is, and you can submit your song right there. So, again, if you listen to this in the future 
And this one's already passed with Butch and Courtney. I probably have another one coming up. So don't be shy. Songwritingpro.com slash events. We'll get you hooked up. Awesome. I think you should mention, too, that there's always a handful of songwriters who don't even submit songs. Mm -hmm. They just enter because they want to keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Like if you're regularly putting out demos and stuff and you're still putting finger snaps in the tracks, you're a year and a half off the mark, man. Like that ended a long time ago, you know, and different things that they hear, different pet peeves that they're having with certain trends or whatever. So Mm -hmm. you can craft even like production stuff and know what kind of songs they're looking for. I think, you get to be a fly in the wall. You yep. get to have an invisible suit and walk into the room. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. And to learn the lingo, learn how publishers talk. And maybe you haven't had your meeting yet, but that just kind of gets you set up for that. So you're like, oh, okay, this is how this stuff works. You know. So when you do get that meeting, you're going to be more comfortable because you've sat in and audited some meetings. And this is live fire. I mean, publishers are like, hey, let me send this. I think I may have a spot for this. Let me listen again. Let me send this to so-and-so over at you know, the label part of it. I and mean, we've had that. So people are having some success with it. So come on. I want you to be one of them. That's right. That's right. You're going to know where the bar's set, too. Mm-hmm. And so if you're being honest with yourself and you're a little bit below the bar, then you're going to be like, okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, that happened to me with Mannequin. You know, I went in thinking, we're great. These people love us. They want to sign us to a touring deal. We're awesome. And then they're like, you should go see Mannequin. I'm like, all right. So I go, like, oh, <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> But we did. We stepped up to the plate, and that was the difference. So, well, hey, that brings us to the end of another Killer Climb episode. And let's just reiterate, in case people missed the intro. Yeah. Let them know the big news again. Oh, yeah. Big news here. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now a part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. That's right. We're super pumped to be part of this network along with some other amazing podcasts. And, Johnny, where can they find that? Yeah, check it out. AmericanSongwriter.com forward slash podcast. Or click the link in the episode notes here and listen to some of the best shows in music. We are in good company. We're honored to be there. Super excited. I'm really looking forward to getting to know these other podcast hosts the ones that we know some of them but not all of them and Mm -hmm. and spreading our knowledge a little bit that way amen brother thank you american songwriter thank you climbers for listening and uh i almost said the thing do the thing (laughs) you don't get ahead of me man listen i'm so excited (laughs) subscribe to the podcast join the climb community tell a friend about it leave a rating and review we're trying to get to 200 this podcast exists because we want you to win so keep on climbing and we'll see you at the top (laughs) 